Okay, so good morning everybody, thank you for coming. Um, it's my special uh, pleasure and uh, privilege to be welcoming my good friend Panos Prevedouros from our years in Chicago. Uh, you came to Northwestern one year after me, That's right. 1985, and when he came he told me my life dream is to live in Hawaii, am I right? Yeah. <laughs> and he did. He finished his PhD at Northwestern and he spent over 25 years. No, 32. 32 years as a professor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He even ran for the mayor of Honolulu twice, and he got near 20% of the vote. So I'd say he's quite a persona. I'm happy to have him here. Uh, Pano, say a few things more about yourself. Thank you, and a privilege to have you here. Sure. Thank you, John. Uh, Actually, this is part of my presentation, so let's get started. So okay. today, I'll be talking to you about uh, you know, the future of transportation and energy with a focus on the mid-century, about uh, 2050. Uh, these are mostly facts and uh, trends, not my uh, personal opinions. So here, for uh, distribution purposes, I have the abstract of the presentation. A little bit about uh, me. John did a good job talking about my basic education which is all in civil engineering and lately my focus has been in sustainability and resilience. Uh, yes, I have the fun fact that I actually did run for mayor twice uh, in 2008 and 2010 and I did quite well as you see uh, in most debates because I brought up important issues and explained them well I did very well, but that 75% translated to 20%, which is great because, you know, a Greek professor in Hawaii, everybody expected to get 2%. I got 20%, good enough. So uh, that was a lot of fun, and since then, you know, people know me about the issues, etc. So I started um, focusing on this subject, which is near and dear to me, but to everybody too, sustainability, right? And big parts of sustainability is transportation and energy. Uh, we know about uh, climate change. This is a ticking time bomb, right? And the beautiful uh, city of Venice already has severe problems with that. Uh, this was in the National Geographic, a gentleman in his house in New Jersey, where his house is not even at the shore. When Hurricane Sandy came, that's the level of the water in his house. That was unprecedented for New Jersey. There are a lot of other pl pl places that flood. But, you know, in the middle of town in New Jersey, to get one meter of uh, water was ridiculous, is one word for it. Uh, there are some good things about this, if you, have, if you haven't seen this graphic, that uh, the North Pole is melting, right? So now Europe can get machinery and cars from uh, South Korea much shorter distance. You basically uh, cut almost a week of travel, which in the shipping business is a big deal. But that's not really a big benefit, right? Because the rest of the Earth suffers. So I have in the beginning three observations of how we all affect Earth. These are, you know, big picture type of things. Uh, first of all, we have the Western world, us, right? So basically, we're operating with an unsustainable lifestyle. We're focused so much on consumption and, and, and uh, comfort. And those are extremely energy intensive. Uh, on the other hand, South America and Africa, they have major issues of deforestation and uh, polluting agriculture. And then Asia, big problem, overpopulation and over uh, heavy industry and dirty industry. Uh, this is a very interesting graphic. Where, after, where will the next 1,000 babies be coming from? Asia, more than half of them. And then Africa, where as you know, Africa, you know, poverty dominates. Um, not a very good thing. And now the amazing thing is that, talking about population, uh, here is the time approximately where I was born, 1960, right? It's not even that far ago. Three billion people. Hmm. Look where we are today, 2022. Eight billion mouths to feed, provide clean water, and all the rest. But just the basics. Food and clean water is very difficult for Earth to provide. And look where we're going at about 2050, 10 billion. Uh, this is really uh, not the best way to uh, operate, really, uh, because there is no planet B or plan B. There's just one Earth, right? So uh, 8, 9, 10 billion is not a sustainable way to, uh, to develop, right? Uh, global sustainability, on the other hand, is a demand and supply. Yeah? Demand is what we require, food, energy, water. Supply is what we can get, okay? 
So uh, there is a balance. Can we achieve it? In theory, we can. But we're going to have a lot of changes, right? So uh, the fourth bullet is a little dark. Both Earth and people have ways to control demand. An example of that is COVID, right? It killed two, three million people. That's a control strategy. But we really don't want to go there. Uh, supply side, so how do we en enhance uh, our things we do? And I take the lead there from breakthrough energy. You probably have or haven't heard that. Breakthrough energy is an outfit that uh, Bill Gates developed out of his, uh, you know, extra money, so to speak, uh, in 2015. And he focuses on five fundamentals. How do we make things? How we produce it? How we get around? How we grow things? and how we live. So those I will address, electricity and transportation, the other areas are nowhere near my expertise. But when you talk about transportation, of course, very important, I added the sixth is location and land use. Location and land use. On the one hand of, uh, let's say, when you talk about location, uh, an interesting trend, and Greece had a lot of it, is migration, people coming into you. How do you control that and how do you uh, support it? And then on a different scale, land use. You have the choice now, what am I going to put on this nice piece of land? Agriculture or solar panels? So that's a different uh, conflict. And of course, there is many, many more, uh, many more areas that you know, civil engineers are not exactly qualified to talk about this, such as you know, women's rights in the third world. Very important, but I'm not going to go there. Uh, most of my talk, unfortunately, has a bias, number one, America, because that's where I've been for 36 years. And as you see, it's a giant economy, and then other giant economy, China. They dominate pretty much the world economy. So those two are pretty central in my uh, presentation. So let's get started. I have three parts for you today and conclusions. First of all, let's talk a little bit about the energy crisis, which is one quote-unquote good thing that came out of the invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia. It, it brought it to the, fro to the front. And this is an excerpt from The Economist that uh, Europe now is reassessing its dependency because they, they cannot find enough energy. So the EU has uh, really a problem with energy policy and finding, of course, uh, resources from dodgy areas, whatever they are. It may be Russia, it may be Africa. Uh, all these are, you know, um, beyond Europe's control. On the other hand, as you know, in Europe there is a lot of pressure for renewables. Uh, it's a good thing, but you really need tremendous amount of energy to supply the industry. Uh, so natural gas will be part of it for a long time. And part of all this now is the conflict between environmentalists and realists. So um, let's talk about the energy crisis. Uh, if you look at the date here, if I'm not mistaken, it says August 16th. That was the price of natural gas in Europe. Look at the, the tradition of what it is. This is about the time that uh, my mom's place in Ayia Parashevi converted from oil to uh, natural gas because it was so cheap, cheap energy. And then look what happened. And now you have the spike. And uh, I think we should take questions at the end because the, the talk is being televised, so it's, it's going to be a little protracted. Uh, and uh, a week later, oh my goodness, I mean $30 more, 30 euro more, euro more. Actually now it's 50 euro down. In, in bottom, bottom line is that you know, it's a completely unpredictable environment with very high prices. Uh, this is not unique in, um, in, the U in the EU. US is also suffering that. So I'll give you just two quick examples. Last year, from the same table in the same source, those folks in the state of Wyoming, for example, they were paying 40 bucks a month for electricity. That 40 bucks became 738, almost double. So you see the problem now is international. It's not, it's not a European thing. Uh, part of it has to do, of course, with uh, how industry manages the supplies, right? Uh, a lot of people in America, they don't understand that, uh, you know, the oil market and the energy market is international. So if I am an international company based in Texas, why would I sell the, the oil at a base price in Wyoming while I can sell it in Europe for three times the price? 
So as you see, naturally the prices go up because of international competition and you sell it where you can get more profits. That makes sense in industry. Then we keep talking about, you know, cleaning up our act in energy, but in reality, uh, these are the retirement of coal plants, which are the polluting ones, but you have many more. And of course, China is at the forefront because they keep building uh, their industry, their economy, and they keep building coal plants. Natural gas is a big deal, so big that, as you see, this Saudi company is investing a hundred billion dollars. This is not, you know, small, uh, small change. A hundred billion is a huge natural gas production. So this facility will be around for 30 to 50 years. So natural gas is where a big trend is going. So let's talk a little bit about emissions. So these are again from Breakthrough Energy. And you want, of course, to minimize emissions, but what are the main sources of emissions? Uh, let's look at the global scale. The top one, the green, is what we, um, what we consume in manufacturing. The second one in blue is what we consume in, um, I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses. The second one is uh, generation of electricity. Uh, the third one is manufacturing. The fourth one is what we do in our uh, um, buildings, air conditioning and heating, etc. And the bottom one is agriculture. No, I have glasses, I'm okay. So the top one, the top one is our near and dear thing, is transportation. So transportation, energy production, manufacture, heating and air conditioning our buildings, and agriculture. Uh, for comparison, I put next to it China and Greece and the United States. Two observations of this when it comes to emissions. Big surprise, United States and Greece look quite similar. So you would think that, you know, the energy profile of, of Greece is weird, but it's not. It's actually quite common and quite near the American one. Big difference is China. China is the manufacturer of the world. Almost 50% of their energy production is for manufacturing. And they are, of course, heavy polluters. The economists came up with uh, some sort of a, of a solution, uh, which is what? Carbon tax. You pollute, you pay, which is very easy for an economist to do, but very hard to implement by politicians, because this carbon tax will affect everything we do, because the electricity you have, it has to go up. It's, it came from polluted sources unless it's renewable or nuclear. Uh, the gasoline in your car, the diesel, etc. So the carbon tax increases prices for the people. It's not a politically easy decision to make. Okay, now that we have this introduction that we're sort of in a difficult situation with a lot of emissions and uh, crisis in pricing, uh, let's talk about some energy alternatives. Um, let's take one that is favorite in Europe and in Greece, uh, wind turbines. Okay, plenty, but there is a call to have many, many more of them. Uh, this particular study in the United States highlights a problem that the United States has and Europe doesn't. Hurricanes, hurricanes. So this report says that, okay, United States, you can do a lot of windmills, but you will have at least a 50% chance that you're gonna lose half of your windmills in case of a hurricane, which is, you know, disastrous. So, uh, Pretty much the private sector wouldn't want to take this risk until, you know, there is some mitigation of the risk. You make all that investment and then you lose it. It's very difficult. Um, this uh, gentleman that I suggest that you look him up and, uh, uh, and, and, and look at his contrarian views. He's a European, the Copenhagen uh, Consensus Center, that looks at these decisions with skepticism. Uh, he believes that uh, turbines and... Uh, Solar panels are feel good, but they really don't solve the problem. I simply pre present his views. You can, uh, you can kind of, you know, do your own uh, thinking about what he says. But uh, in large respect, he's, uh, he's quite on point that uh, the electricity from these sources is problematic. Problematic. Let's take one problem. A lot of the windmills are getting quite old. Particularly in the United States and California, there were wind farms with tens of thousands of them. And every 10 years, you have to change the blades. 
Now the blades in one of these things is approximately the size of a Boeing 747 wing. So we are talking about extremely massive things made of materials that they are not really, you cannot bury them, and it's very difficult to do anything with them. However, there is a process now to make cement out of it. Okay, not bad, but if you follow the details of the process, the process to make cement out of those things is extremely energy intensive. So somebody really has to do a very, diff a very careful analysis, life cycle analysis, etc., to see if that actually makes sense. Uh, for now, they simply bury them. They have giant uh, machines that they cut them in, you know, 20 meter sections and they just stack them and bury them. Uh, which is not really the best, but at least they are fairly inert. They don't pollute the earth. Solar is actually uh, has very good uh, features to it. One of these things is that it's incremental. Uh, to go down to the simplest thing, you can have solar in your own house and you can go off grid. Some people have done it. Or you can have uh, small outfits. This is a small outfit. This is Porsche, but not a big Porsche in uh, Germany. It's the Porsche North America. It's the importer of the cars, but still, now that they keep importing a lot of electric cars, they need to maintain them, etc., until they sell them. That takes a lot of electricity, and they say, hmm, maybe we shouldn't be paying the utility. If we have this outfit here, we can do our own little solar grid and get off uh, paying all these big bills. So this modularity of uh, solar is actually very welcome. And in many cases, it will, uh, you know, cut down on emissions and depending on big utilities. That's one simple answer to uh, the land use problem I talked to you in the introduction. Agriculture versus solar panels. Well, the Department of Energy and others have started addressing it. They actually gave it a name, agrivoltaic. And there is one uh, pretty sizable, 80 megawatts, is not really a small generation, uh, in uh, this county in, uh, in Colorado. So I provide some of these details in case you want to go uh, check it out yourself. So these things are actual. However, of course, when you talk about 80 megawatts, it's big, but not that big. The city of Honolulu, that is about a million people, I speak about it because I spent 32 years. I wish I could speak like that for Athens, but I don't have the details. You see this number, 80 megawatt? Honolulu needs 1,500 megawatt in one day. So again, think about the scale, right? So even if I had this in Honolulu, it wouldn't even solve 6% of my problem. So uh, hydropower, hydropower, very clean, we like it. Most countries have dams. But uh, here, this article from um, NBC says, why we're forgetting this giant? Uh, well, actually, environmentalism killed it. Uh, now we have climate killing it, drought. If you go to the big Lake Mead, which is behind the famous Hoover Dam that is actually feeding uh, Las Vegas and California, Lake Mead is, is, is incredible. It has pretty much disappeared. They started finding dead people uh, because they're all buried down there. So the, the depth from 40 meters, it's approximately 10. Once you hit 8 meters, no more hydroelectric. There is not enough you know, potential to, uh, to create power. Tremendous. And of course, the environmental problem is that if you create artificial lakes, you kill a lot of things. You kill villages, you kill species, and all of that. So that's why environmentalists really don't like that. In rare cases, this has become a solution for intermittency. What is the intermittency? The wind blows now, the wind doesn't blow. So how do I deal with this problem? And of course, the intermittency of solar is very clear. I produce during the day, I have nothing after sunset. How do we deal with that? This is a special case in Michigan, where you have a real lake here, and you have a raised uh, uh, piece of earth on which they were able to create an artificial lake, which is uh, uh, called now, the solution is called pump storage. Because you see, I don't know if the projection is very clear, but there's a giant wind farm in the back. So you have a lot of wind electricity, right? So when you have extra, you run the pumps the opposite way and you take water to the top. And at night or whenever the wind dies, you uh, run the water the opposite way and you generate electricity. That's a very clean way to have essentially a water battery. It's a form of battery, right? That, but you have to find the right place and the right circumstances to be able to do this. 
uh, in most places is not possible. Now here, I don't want to go into the trivia of the thing, but there are so many technologies under development for what? Storage. Again, we have a lot of renewables, but if we don't store their power, we cannot manage it. And when we lose it, then what? I mean, imagine having a, a hospital running out of solar electricity. And then the sun comes over and what? The operating room gets dark in the middle of heart surgery? Not really. You have generators, you have other things. But how do you do this in the long run and for a big city? You can solve the problem at the hospital level. How do you solve it for a city of 4 million people like Athens? Different scale. So all these technologies are developing, but there is a catch. The catch is, look at the megawatt again. Pretty small. None of them are 1,000 megawatts. Hmm? So that will come into play as we talk. Another one invented by the Swiss, gravity battery. This is very good because it's very compact. In fact, we can actually put one down at the port or at the side of a big stadium. So you have this big crane, and basically it builds towers. Every time there is ex excess electricity, it uses motors to lift these very heavy concrete blocks vertically and creates towers. Once the wind drops, you take these towers and you just take them down. So then it works the opposite way, like regenerative brakes in your electric car. Very, uh, this, the, the beauty of this is that it's so compact and so clean. So essentially, you have a huge yard. You got yourself a neighborhood battery with this type of system. So again, not cheap, but uh, pretty clean and pretty compact. Again, out of uh, Swiss, this is total theory, as you see is the famous aluminum battery. Look at where we are here with batteries. Do you see the little yellow bar over there? Tiny ability to store. And look what the aluminum battery promises to do. Completely ga game changer, right? Okay, so I have it here to, take your, uh, to bring it to your attention and let's see what happens in 10 years. Right now, is, this is complete theory that nobody actually tested it even at a fairly uh, sizable scale. Many of these things work great in the lab. It's what you do when you try to scale it. Another good source of uh, energy, and the northern Europeans have discovered that in quite a few places in America, is WT, waste to energy. Uh, the best one was, and it's a beautiful one, the rest are not beautiful, they're just factories, uh, is this one, you see it on in cross section. It's in uh, Denmark, it's in Copenhagen. You know, uh, the, the Danes are very sensitive about the environment. They actually created a waste to energy. Waste is basically the garbage of the city. And what happens is that in first world countries like Europe and America, uh, we throw so much paper and plastic in there that the thermal content is almost as good as lignite, lignitis, lignite. So basically you have a free energy source. And uh, Sweden actually overinvested in that and feeds their neighbors. And in Copenhagen, they did that and actually they combined it with recreation. This one becomes a ski slope in the winter. So very interesting idea. Uh, this is something we've uh, been working in Hawaii uh, personally with my students because in Hawaii we have ways to energy and we wanted to increase it. Uh, this is a small article about it and I'll blow up to just show you um, how good waste to energy can be if you can handle it. Because actually, it's a, it's a huge win-win. Uh, that's why, as I said, Germany and Sweden are so much into it. Uh, and at some point, I thought uh, Athens was discussing it, but then nothing happened. Uh, basically, for all the other sources, you have to pay to get the fuel, right? Uh, this is oil, you have to pay a lot. But, uh, or you have to create infrastructure to get the sun out of the solar. Interesting thing in the waste to energy, your fuel is not zero cost like the sun, it's negative. In other words, the city pays you to take the trash. That happens everywhere, right? I mean, you can be the owner of a landfill and then you tell the city, okay, pay me 10 bucks every truck load you bring in. So now the city pays the waste to energy company to take the trash, the company burns them, and then sells the electricity. It's a total win-win. Uh, what is the catch? The catch is very expensive to develop. There is no waste to energy that doesn't start as a price at $300 million, which is very big amount for a municipality. And number two, the municipality has to be 
big and rich to have you know big thermal content type of trash. So specialized problems, but uh, it's a way to do it. Again, nothing that environmentalists would approve, because again, this is clear close to a lignite plant. So actually, in America, when you implement that, the actual factor is about a hundred million dollars, and the environmental controls are two hundred million dollars to clean all the fumes. Uh, so another one that actually I want to talk, it's in the graph, but it's specialized is geothermal. Geothermal is very clean, but you have to have volcanic energy. So maybe we can put a small one in uh, Santorini if there is something, because actually Santorini is still working underneath. So as you see, the countries that they are listed with uh, very large geothermal actually are countries that they do have volcanoes. And you wouldn't think that uh, America has so many volcanoes, but uh, uh, all you have to think is a few of the national uh, parks that they actually contain, the geysers and everything. So all these are essentially volcanoes. And New Zealand has among the best plans to share it with the autonomous, the indigenous people, the Maoris. They have a profit sharing scheme, so the profits from that electricity also helps the community. So the big one now that uh, everybody has started pivoting back to, remember at the time of uh, Merkel in Germany, go away, bad nuclear power. Now even Germany is shifting back because nuclear power to the rescue. There is nothing else that will generate thousands of megawatts and clean air at the same time. So uh, this is back in the forefront. Uh, if we're serious about climate change, uh, we have to talk the N-word, nuclear. Uh, and I, in fact, you, you can search around, the, the story is that the nuclear industry is optimistic that the, uh, the nuclear plants have a chance of doubling in the next 30 years, which is my horizon, 2050. That is gonna be a lot of investment. Of course, planning and reality uh, often don't match, but at least there is impetus for it, instead of the opposite way of closing them, okay? Um, these things are extremely complicated. This is the Vocal plan in Georgia, close to Atlanta, Georgia. And sometimes you think that, you know, when you have a new installation, everything goes wrong. But this is Vocal units three and four. They already have one and two since the 70s and the 80s. So they tried to build two more. They said it's gonna be 14 billion. Now they have to pay 30 billion. These are massive. They generate about 4,000 megawatts each. So it's a huge development, not only for Georgia, but to sell electricity in the neighboring states and make a lot of money. So they are 14 years late and 14 billion short, which is scary. Uh, it's good to have these kinds of failures in the United States. You cannot afford to duplicate it in Greece. The country can go broke, right? So you have to be very careful. There's a lot of countries that they cannot afford this size of mistakes. This eventually will pay off. That's why keep, people keep throwing money at it. But you know, you have to have the, uh, the banking system behind it to uh, support it. Uh, objectively, and that's again from The Economist, nuclear energy is extremely safe. Uh, these are the accidents in the coal industry, the oil industry, etc. Nuclear is unbelievably pretty much as safe as solar. That's what the numbers say. You see, we have a perceptional problem, but the reality is much different. Nuclear is very safe, and we have now, since the 1950s, 70 years of experience about it. So we're not guessing. This is it. And, and we're talking about having accidents in very old plants. The modern plants are extremely safe. They literally shut down themselves so that you really cannot have an accident. They have so many controls. Uh, that's a number of deaths. Uh, this is a scientific article out of the US Department of Energy of how many deaths were avoided by having the nuclear plants we have in terms of clean air and also dangerous substitute energy. What's the big hope now? That uh, the nuclear thing will be diversified, it'll be different. One big stretch is this one, the modular reactors. So this thing is gonna be like a six to 10 story building that you literally bury it in the ground and it can become your neighborhood nuclear reactor. These are small, these are about 100 to 200 megawatts. So they are excellent for, you know, small cities. Uh, the other side is uh, actually sort of Turkey stole my idea. It wasn't really mine, but in 2008, when I ran as mayor in Hawaii, I did say, let's have a floating power plant. 
So, okay, we don't want it in the land, just put it 10 miles out the horizon and connect it with a cable, problem solved. And the, the Navy has so many ships that you can actually take them for free and then make a nuclear power plant. Well, Turkey did. <laughs> in fact, they developed two of these and they rent it all over the world, making a lot of money. So that's a Turkish floating Russian power plant. Uh, very actual. So when it comes to, now to uh, nuclear policy, uh, California reversed. They were closing their giant close to Los Angeles power plant in 2025. Now they immediately passed the law. Don't touch it until 2035 and then we'll think about it. So they gave it a long list of life. And this is an old plant. And the European Union changed its uh, law. Once you change the laws, you're done. It's the law. Now nuclear power is considered green. So therefore, you can invest it on an equal basis as solar panels. Uh, legal things are very significant because uh, this is an article, if you take the presentation, it's a good summary uh, that you can, uh, the discrete charm of nuclear power. So in summary, there is a lot of emphasis on nuclear energy, but the big energy production is natural gas and nuclear power. So let's not forget what the basics are all about. Uh, there is a lot more to talk about, ocean systems, etc., but we try to fit everything in 45 minutes, so we cannot really go there. Final part, my expertise is transportation. Let's, let's talk a little bit about transportation. Electric vehicles and CAVs. Anybody know what CAV stands for? Hmm. Connected autonomous vehicles. So, talking about clean fuels, we have two sources of clean fuels. One from the bottom here is natural gas. It's considered semi-clean, right, compared to oil and coal. The other sources from the top are renewable energy, nuclear energy. What can I do with these two things? I have two options. I take the machinery and I go to this side and I generate hydrogen. That gives me what? Fuel cells. Or I use these fuels to run power plants to produce electricity to store it into batteries and have electric vehicles. So two major paths then, hydrogen-based vehicles and battery-based vehicles. So keep that in your mind as to where, what we're going to be dealing in the next 20, 30 years. So one way of making uh, hydrogen is actually two ways of making hydrogen, is uh, through, through electrolysis and then produce either hydrogen directly or something that we knew from Second World War. Ammonia. There were actual cars and trucks and buses around the Second World War that you fed them with ammonia. So that's something that we know. We have a tradition of doing that. And ammonia doesn't explode. That's also very good. This is a company that you haven't even heard of. It's called CATL, Contemporary Abrex Technology. It's the largest battery maker in the world. It's based in China. It has multiple factories. Now they have developed a new lithium-ion phosphorus battery, which is, all of a sudden we know, at the same price, 15% more energy density, uh, which is very good news. That supposedly Elon Musk bought this. They're going to put them in the Model Y of Tesla, if you're a little familiar with the Tesla cars. And the target is 1,000 kilometers in one charge. So approximately, you charge that vehicle and you go to the Saloniki and back, and you don't have to charge it. So it really takes away uh, range anxiety. Brand new batteries ready to be installed in consumer products. This is not a lab thing. It's an actual uh, marketable technology. Battery problems. A lot of people, particularly in America, they're very concerned. What are we going to do with all these batteries? After 10 years, they go bad. So we're going to have a huge problem with all this uh, extremely uh, chemical involved uh, things being buried and polluting the water sources, etc. Well, actually, uh, that's not the idea. The idea is that uh, it's very easy to take these cells and then in the batteries have a very intense cycle for cars because the car accelerates, decelerates, continuously does things. But you can put them in the building, which is a far more mild type of electricity uh, expenditure and storage. So they can have a second life in the buildings, and eventually when they are dead, you basically pulverize them and you treat them as iron ore that you take from the earth. You start separating the material and you completely recycle, particularly the expensive metals. So it could be a complete cycle. Why does some of this not happen yet? 
because there is no critical mass. Once you have start, start having a billion thrown away batteries, now you open a factory and you can work 24 hours a day and do this thing. If you have, you know, a million batteries, you cannot open a factory, it'll work in a month and then you have to stop. So you have to reach what's called critical mass at some point, you know, because the electric cars are still young, right? We're not throwing away batteries yet. So this is something that will come five, ten years down the road because there's going to be a lot of batteries, old batteries, to work with. That's another battery problem, particularly for Europe and the United States. They got a lot of these metals and materials, right? So look at the graph and look who produces them. China, Congo, Chile, Mexico, Indonesia. None of them are Europe and America. So you guys start having the same thing, the geopolitical problem. Do you trust Congo? Or who's going to get Congo to Congo first and control the government so you can control the ore? A lot of interesting ramifications about this. So it's the materials sourcing part is not easy when it comes to batteries. Of course, there is a classic problem. Which one is cheaper, gasoline car or electric car? It depends where you are, what the price is. This is a comparison of two identical VWs in the United States. As you see, the electric one is very expensive to get compared to the gasoline one. But also, you can get a credit. Quite surprisingly, Biden passed a law to make it better, but the 7,500 went down to 4,000. That makes it a little less because this is negative. Uh, of course, gasoline cars have to pay the electricity, the, gas, the, the, the gasoline, I'm sorry, which keeps going up. So how many years is it going to take? Five or six? By most analysis, eventually the electric car will come ahead. If you keep using it for after six years, you will save money. At least that's the theory for now. Most of the models have not been out yet. In our paper we published in 2015, we said there is a lot of unknowns. The prices is high. So the best solution actually is the combination of both, the hybrid, uh, which actually was the winning tri uh, policy for uh, Toyota. Toyota has made a killing internationally with the Prius types of cars. They have, the others are selling in the, in the thousands, Toyota is selling them in the, mil in the millions. You can find in Athens or Oval, the, 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 Yaris Pri the Yaris Hybrid is all over the, so they know a good thing. So this was good and it's probably going to last a little longer and we're going to see a graph about this. The funny thing about batteries is that actually, with the current technology, they're pretty bad, even as we speak. This is what this graph says. This is the energy density. How much energy you have for the weight and volume of a battery? Well, they're good for a house. I mean, you can, fool, you can fill a battery of your house, make a room of it full of batteries, you'll be good. You can't carry a room on your car, right? That's why you needed all these portable fuels, hydrogen, diesel, petrol, good energy. But there was a smart guy that actually invested so much and made a great product out of it. Elon Musk and Tesla. A lot of people tried it. We had electric vehicles all along. None of them was a huge success. And then here comes this guy, and the electric vehicle market explodes. Uh, this graph tells the story. It's actually unbelievable, right? This is the value of Tesla, the dark blue. The light blue is the next five combined. We're talking about mega companies like Toyota and VW, etc. And look what he did with Tesla. It is amazing. So the numbers tell the story. Uh, so good or bad, it is what it is. And this is where it's going. Eventually, as you see, the red line is the hybrids. The hybrids are doing good, but in about 10 years, they're going to be surpassed by electric vehicles. And of course, conventional vehicles are going downward. And as you know, in some places in, the, the, uh, the year in Europe and in California, they establish specific years after which gasoline cars can, or fossil fuel cars cannot be sold anymore. So that's, that's where things are going. Uh, a few more thoughts about uh, electric cars. Um, Battery is a big problem, as we said, expensive, heavy, etc. Well, the Italians, and this is one of several, the Koreans have others, the British. Uh, how about contactless charging, like contactless charging of your phone? So as you drive along, you charge your car, then you carry only a smallish battery. And you don't have to have this over 200 miles, let's say, or 200 kilometers, Patras Athens distance, no. Every 10 kilometers, you have five kilometers of uh, contactless. Empty, full, empty, full, etc. So you don't have to super invest. So there may be ways of actually maintaining long distance travel without really 
taking a lane and completely electrifying it. So, interesting concepts. Uh, problems with this, of course, compatibility. Who's going to have the upper hand to create one system that everything is compatible? Is there a no compatible with a Honda, compatible with the other brand? Uh, Tesla systems like Apple tend to be closed. They don't share technology. So Tesla may go their own way, plug it at home. We're not going to use the public roads for that. Who knows? This is a brand new mega company in the United States. They're my neighbors in California. That then Their name is Autonomy. They figured out that electric vehicles for many people are a problem. First of all, they're very expensive. And second is that, you know, they are not sure that they like them. They solve this problem. Rent an electric vehicle for a minimum of three months. And then see if you like it. So uh, that's the way that uh, it might go. Long-term rentals. So it's a very good idea. And as you see, these guys are ordering cars in the thousands to facilitate that. So you can actually choose what model electric car you want. You want a Kia, you want a Tesla. Uh, this is a connected autonomous vehicles made in China, the second model. Uh, the interesting thing is made by Baidu. Baidu is their Google, their search engine. It's not made by a manufacturer. So this is ready for taxi service in China as we speak. One big characteristic, take a good look at the picture. There is no steering wheel or pedals. It's just a pod. Uh, similar pods in San Francisco, t tested by this company called Zoox, uh, which is an outfit of a, a supporter company by Amazon. Sweden has a tradition of uh, electric trucks, Einride. They got license to test them in the United States. So that's another big deal, electric trucks. Most of them, you know, they're not for thousands of miles, but for uh, reasonable deliveries. Uh, when it comes to logistics and long distance transportation, who is going to win? Battery trucks or, as we said, the fuel cell or hydrogen trucks? It seems like that when you have to use trucks in the city, like your garbage trucks, your school buses, your regular battery is good. If you are going to do long distance, you cannot afford to be carrying a huge battery because then the truck cannot carry goods. So maybe the hydrogen path will be better because it's more like a fuel. So in the next uh, decade, will be dominated by battery vehicles, uh, modest autonomous vehicles deployments. The problem with hydrogen is still uh, the distribution, and that's an open question. The question, we don't know what's going to happen really by 2050. And politics, really, and lawyers will determine what happens to autonomous vehicles because of liability. And uh, who, is, who is in charge, right, when you have accidents? We always have somebody in charge, right? Who is in charge here? Uh, there is a case of a Californian police stopped in autonomous vehicles. How do, we, do you give a ticket to a vehicle with no steering wheel, no drivers, no nothing? It was just going somewhere. So a lot of issues like that. So conclusions. Uh, well, if we want to look 30 years forward, quickly take 40 years, 30 years back. We didn't have any of this. The GPS, the Teslas, the safety systems in our cars, the toll tags to pay the tolls automatically, charging stations, and all so many other things. So relocation, let's, let's start a few issues. First of all, we have migration. It's a huge issue that changes the geography and the population. Second one, very significant, people don't want to go to work. They want to continue to work from home. So that's good news, but creates a different transportation system. And we already build a lot of mass transit to take people to downtown Athens to work. What if they don't use it? That's a lost investment. And of course, we have the exodus, at least in America and Germany. They don't want to be in the center of Stuttgart and Manhattan. They want to be out in the boonies, which is nice and clean. They don't want to deal with people with masks and what have you. And here it is, the number, the, the county statistics in the United States, it uh, shows it that particularly after COVID, rural communities are going up which is amazing. Everybody kept talking about urbanization, right? We're going, now we're going back to village. It's that's incredible. Uh, in transportation, we're going to have micro cars, electric vehicles, contactless, less transit use, more private use in uh, small cities. Uh, very significant. We're going to have automated delivery. Already it has started. At the University of Nevada, Reno, where my daughter is, everywhere you walk, there are either little robots in the in the corridors carrying lunches to people or documents uh, to, uh, from one secretary to the next. 
There are no students involved to do these things anymore. So it's pretty fun. Uh, Deutsche Bahn is the German trains. They'll do the same with uh, little pods. Take you from the rail station to a few destinations in town. No driver, no nothing. Melbourne, the same thing. They saw a decrease in their buses of 70%. And now they're switching on them into on demand. Call the bus. Stop waiting at the station. There is no bus coming you know, regularly because that doesn't work anymore. Energy needs. We need a lot of energy to try to run transportation. So we need clean energy. And it's going towards nuclear here, I want you to pay attention to two things. Number one, Russia's invasion of Ukraine resulted in the natural gas crisis. You know what the next one is? Uh, China's invasion of Taiwan. We're going to have a huge challenge for batteries and all the manufacturing that happens in China because we're going to blockade it, right? How are we going to get it if we blockade it? The same thing. Uh, conflicts between environmentalists and realists, the ones that they say, you know, we need energy. So uh, let's skip this one. So the energy potential then, it's not going to happen until 2050. Uh, we're not going to have super mini cheap batteries. The, 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 the key word here is affordable. A technology can do a lot of things, but they are not really affordable. So the affordable part where still uh, the inexpensive part is not possible. Cold fusion, right, like nuclear energy, but cold safe, not really happening because everything is too far in the horizon. So the last one is this one. This is pretty much where Bill Gates and a lot of other people, that they, they have a clue about how they can produce energy in large numbers and safely are focusing. It's uh, small nuclear reactors, which you see an example here of how buried it is uh, with the factories. And this is basically in an industrial zone. And the problem solves itself like that, not with massive nuclear plants. Some interesting links when you see the presentation or if you get the file, just two, three links. And final slide, none of this existed three years ago, right? Well, Apple was, but it was quite small. But Amazon, with all the deliveries, the supplier of the world, essentially, Netflix, Google, Facebook, they have a tremendous potential, these guys, for the better to start changing, you know, our social priorities. Because if we don't change our social priorities, particularly in the first world, uh, obtaining any source of sustainability is not going to happen. Just air conditioning, you know, it consumes more than the whole Africa consumes for their basic needs in terms of electricity. And that is for me. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Any about, questions? Yes, yes. Let me use the prerogative of the uh, moderator. Yeah. Like we can use this for questions from whoever. Alexander, you can hear it, right? Okay. So, if you could go back to slide 37, I want to make a point with you and see how you respond to that. Okay. That was the one with the risk. Yes. Okay. One thing I wanted to point out and see how you feel about that. Yes. It's the one with how safe is nuclear energy. Oh, Sorry, my that's numbering is different. That's okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, but again, the number of fatalities per terawatt hours is the viewpoint of the industry, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You, it's like someone who flies on an airplane, That's right. the number of fatalities per passenger kilometers is the lowest in an airplane, That's right. but the number of fatalities per hours you spend in the plane is the highest among media. Mm -hmm. So from the perspective of a passenger, actually airplane is dangerous to fly. Yes, because I, I'm just wondering now, right. I'm going to stop. In the case of energy, right, uh, fatalities per terawatt hours is the viewpoint of the industry. How about the viewpoint of the community nearby? Yes, but the, the facts show, but your point is very well taken, uh, because it's, you know, as every time we talk about accidents, it's what type of exposure you use to divide it, what, what is in the uh, denominator. So that's one way to do it, there are industries ways, but when it comes to nuclear, the fact remains that, you know, even with what happened in Japan in 2011, there was no direct fatality. And that was, that was a nuclear reactor designed in 1955 and built in 1957. And still, despite the giant tsunami and the failures that happened, there was no fatality. So uh, th that's my message to the neighborhoods. Okay. So, 
beyond that, then it's just, you know, uh, specula speculation. Okay, let me, uh, who wants to ask a question? Please use this and pass it on to the next person. Thank you for your uh, presentation, first of all. Uh, I would like to make two points slash questions. The first one is regarding hydrogen systems and energy storage. Uh, there is a lot of discussion going on uh, concerning the green hydrogen, uh, the turquoise or the blue hydrogen. What I'm wondering is, uh, given the very good uh, nature of uh, nuclear energy, why we're not talking about pink hydrogen and red hydrogen, which uh, can serve the automotive and uh, transportation uh, sector as well, very well. Uh, it can be cheap and uh, environmentally friendly. And this is my, the first question that I have. Uh, do you want that uh, you respond on that? I proceed with no, the second one. Go, go ahead. So, yeah, 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 so. Okay, and the second one, uh, regarding your um, last slide about big tech companies, uh, maybe we should uh, analyze a bit more about decentralized systems because uh, it's obvious that these companies can create small parts of decentralized systems as well which can be adopted in a house level uh, so maybe we're going through a change in the energy sector which will be completely different from what we knew before and now some other models that we don't have the concepts anymore yeah. Right. Uh, you are absolutely correct. This is this is the way that is going, in many many respects. Decentralization. First of all, the whole idea of globalization has pretty much failed. Uh, people don't want things to be produced in one place, such as China or other place, and be imported. They want back their industrial base. Same thing with power generation. That's why I mentioned, you know, Porsche bought that, and this is just a very small example. My son's school and all of others. They create. Uh, modular essentially uh, grid systems for their own modular electricity uh, so the big utility plan is going away too however on a mega city version you cannot do that uh, there is no way that you can make you know small cells in already built cities like Athens not to mention Shanghai which is almost 20 million people you cannot create these microgrids but there is possibility with the small nuclear reactors to at least have you know decentralized power production. Uh, Amazon itself is decentralized, right? I mean, they have so many different warehouses. It's a little different in Europe. Most of Amazon in Europe works out of Germany, so it's centralized. But in the US, it's quite decentralized. They have uh, very, because there is no point, you know, to send a big truck or an airplane across the United States for distribution. So it all comes down to uh, cost effectiveness. I mean, these types of companies are not, uh, are not dumb. They make decisions to allow them to make a profit and their profit margins are small. So they create the best for the conditions that they exist and they prefer to locate where energy prices are low. That's why you don't see them in California. So they have, they have a lot of choices to do. Uh, the companies I showed actually are among the, if you look at the links I sent, one of the presenters says, these tech companies, they have one very big negative thing they talk so much well about the environment but they keep developing things that they are power hungry yeah all the technologies you have to have this and this and this and that and that all of them power hungry they keep developing de the mega servers right uh, not to talk about bitcoins what are these server farms right they are farm they they are spending incredible amounts of electricity to create a bitcoin or whatever the coin you want to call right so all these technological things are about more energy consumption not less and they keep incentivizing us to do more things like you know it became very famous in five six years ago people had bucket lists all of a sudden that word became bucket list travel there go to Santorini do this go to uh, uh, you know that place do that etc creating things more for consumption and energy consumption fuel consumption and energy consumption for people we keep moving in the wrong direction nobody says stay home come down and you know stop spending so it's complicated. It's what lifestyle we want versus what can be supported. And then the, the, the dark part is, you know, what happens to the developing and the undeveloped world? None of this trickled down, right? I mean, uh, talking about uh, standard of living in Greece, Switzerland, 
versus Timbuktu or what have you. Completely different. We have time for one more question. Gentleman in the back. So that's going to be the last question. Uh, what about infrastructure, public grids inside the cities? Uh, converting local mobility from petrol to electricity actually means transferring the burden of power from the refineries to the power grid. Right. But we already have an infrastructure problem with cables, uh, transformers, and things like that. Absolutely. So if suddenly nothing is really change one million automobiles from gasoline to electricity mm -hmm. with the energy grid able to cope with that, what we are going to face uh, yes. blackout? You, you are asking a question which uh, it's almost humorous what happened in the internet in the past week. In the past week the state of California passed the law as I mentioned to not have polluting cars sold after 2035. In other words Californians need to buy electric vehicles. Four days later, big panic in the media, reduce electricity consumption because a heat wave is coming. So turn off your electric car and don't commute. I mean, there was the juxtaposition of the two is comical, really. I mean, the timing is terrible. We will have big problems like that. On the other hand, now, the electric companies tell you that your electric vehicle, your Tesla, can actually become the stabilizer of the grid. Because if you connect it sometimes of the day, I will start drawing battery out of it to stabilize the grid. Or I will draw out, my Tesla has 80% charge. It'll take 20% of it and give it to John because his Tesla is at 10%. So you're going to be having rebalancing issues like that, which supposedly a smart grid can do. So that's what the utilities will tell you. We haven't reached that point even in the 5%, let alone the 10 or 20%. So this may be a forthcoming problem after 2025, 2030 with significant amount of electric vehicles. But definitely the grid will be an issue for uh, utilities to manage. Infrastructure, as you said. Finally, again, thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you for coming.